And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the great Herman Tavani, following on from Diane Martin um, in the Public Interest Technology Colloquium, 9th of November, titled A Dynamic Ethical Framework for Analyzing Controversial Aspects of Emerging and Converging Technologies. Herman Tavani is a professor emeritus at Riviere University, was Riviere College, uh, and has granted an amazing contribution into cyber ethics, digital ethics, technology and ethics, computer ethics, you name it. He is first among many of that generation of scholars uh, to inform us uh, about the, the great things that technology has to bring and those things that we should be watching out for and providing for us an avenue in which we can analyze through privacy, uh, through security, through ethics, through different philosophical discussions uh, about the impact of technology. This is the great yellow screen website. I've often gone back to looking for sources, uh, but shows how illustrious uh, Herman has been. One indication is to say not only the many awards he's won, but who actually gives over 100 keynotes. Uh, very rare uh, for us to find an academic of this caliber. Uh, he has contributed so much to the ACM. He's occasionally also presented and published in the IEEE as well for the IEEE Technology and Society magazine a number of book reviews, but all of these acclaimed uh, journal outlets. He's been a reviewer, he's been an editor, he's been so many things. Uh, and these are the versions of the ethics and technology book I remember, uh, and many of my students, thousands of them, uh, usually would have between two and 400 students each session in one university using this text uh, in hard copy. Um, incredible contributions, as I mentioned, to informational privacy, uh, this one going back to 1999. Uh, this classic one with James Moore uh, introducing the RAUC uh, calculus model, which a lot of university PhD students have relied on to get through their research. Uh, introductions to book chapters, the term cyber ethics, I think, uh, although we can date back and look at so many others who at the same time or similar time, I always point to Herman as the man uh, who was very much responsible for making this a, a, a global nomenclature. Uh, this one on the uniqueness debate in computer ethics, what exactly is at issue and why does it matter in the great journal Ethics and Information Technology. Uh, this other one here, uh, Philosophical Theories of Privacy, another classic uh, in metaphilosophy. Uh, this one on Floridi's ontolog ontological theory of informational privacy, some implications and challenges. Uh, but again, how lucky are we to have these two incredible speakers here today and I'll say thank you. Uh, to Herman uh, for opening his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katina, for, for your very generous and gracious introduction. And I'm honored to be here. It, it, it's a pleasure to be able to speak at your uh, colloquium series. So I'm just going to go through and see if I can um, get the. Um, okay. Looks great. Thank you again. Uh, so um, I'm going to be speaking today about a dynamic ethics framework. Um, and as I mentioned in the abstract, I'm just going to examine some ethical aspects of converging and emerging technologies, kind of focusing on the following questions. What is meant by expressions converging technology, emerging technology? Why are the ethical implications so difficult to anticipate? Is the so-called standard ethical framework we've used to analyze moral issues adequate for addressing concerns and converging and emerging technologies? What are some key differences between what we call the ethics last and ethics first approaches for analyzing recent technologies? And how can a dynamic ethics model, for example, the one introduced by Jim Moore and then by Jim Moore and Weckert and others, uh, better help us to analyze ethical issues that arise in the context of emerging and converging technologies? I'm not going to argue for a brand new ethical theory. Some have suggested we need the end of these emerging technologies. I am going to argue instead that we should expand upon that framework by incorporating a dynamic component or a step into that framework. And what I'm talking about today is part of a larger project. I've got to, I believe it should be expanded for other reasons as well, but I'm not going to touch on those. I'm just going to limit my discussion today to, uh, to some issues affecting emerging and converging technologies. So just let me begin by trying to figure out what do we mean exactly by convergence, technological convergence. So we all know about converging lines, et cetera, at least converging in an ordinary language way. In a technical sense in computing technology, one interesting uh, definition is a coming together of two or more different entities 
the integration of two or more different technologies, a single device or a system. And then even more technically speaking, there's something just called technological convergence. It's a phrase that's been used by others. I think Ryan Gold, for example, talks about what happens when two or more unrelated technologies, unanticipated paths converge unexpectedly to create an entirely new field. So um, convergence in the context of digital technology or cyber technology, I'll use that phrase today, is not is that exactly new or even a recent phenomenon. It's been ongoing, I think, since the inception of the technology. If you go back to the first computers that were standalone mainframe computers, it was, was a short while after that that they were, you saw some convergence with communications technologies and the beginning of computer networks. As I mentioned before, Rheingold talks about how in the 1980s, unexpectedly, uh, video technology and computer hardware technology came about and, and produced something called virtual reality technology. So I'd argue that many, if not most emerging technologies are the result of technological convergence. I'm not gonna claim that all of them are, uh, but I think uh, it's safe to say that, that, that many of them have been. And some of these uh, convergent technologies actually created new fields, which seems to be happening now in an unprecedented pace. I'll just mention a few of those of how cyber technologies and non-cyber technologies have come together to, to converge and form new fields. We have the fields of bioinformatics, for example, computational biology, computational genomics, all of which themselves have raised some interesting ethical issues. So if you look at the field of computational genomics, which is made possible by the convergence, if you like, of a couple of different technologies. So you had some work, really work in AI with pattern matching algorithms, and data mining techniques, and, you, and it, it, it came together with uh, genomic research in a way to be able to model and sequence the human genome. Ironically, the uh, technology and techniques were used to accelerate the sequencing of the genome also had threatened privacy of research subjects who needed to participate in publish in genomic studies. So there's been a double-edged sword. Other kinds of issues that arose in this field were informed consent or actually versus presumed consent because research subjects now were subject to uh, data mining and uh, it was difficult to know what they were consenting to. The question of ownership of one's personal genetic data arose from this new field. And as a result of the famous decode genetics controversy about who would own the data, the personal genomic data in that database. Another interesting field that, uh, that emerged from this technology is uh, nanocomputing because of cyber technology and nanotechnology, I guess that. And a field called nanoethics, a new field of applied ethics, which uh, developed in response to issues at the intersection of these two technologies. Um, some ethical, legal, social controversies arising in nanoethics, and there are many, which include privacy concerns with nanoscale devices, uh, nanoscale weapons, uh, in the hands of uh, terrorists and rogue nations, runaway robots, I'm sorry, uh, uh, nanobots, and the problem leading to the gray goose scenario where nanobots disassemble matter, et cetera. So uh, we seem to hear about new and emerging technologies almost daily, right? Uh, and a recent report by the Bank of America identified 14 emerging technologies. Interesting, it did not mention I think the ethical implications of these look at it from a more from a financial perspective. But among these were some interesting uh, technologies like synthetic biology and, and uh, brain computer interfaces, emotional artificial intelligence. And we hear a lot now about the uh, metaverses up and coming. I'm not going to examine these technologies uh, or their ethical aspects today. I'm just going to, to mention those. Another emerging technology that's very hotly debated right now is. Uh, autonomous vehicles or smart cars, which resulted from the convergence of <clears throat> automotive technology and artificial intelligence. I'm not going to uh, mention that either today. I am going to focus briefly on the ethical implications of two relatively new emerging uh, technologies, ambient intelligence and the Internet of Things. <clears throat> so ambient intelligence has been defined as a technology that enables people to live and work in environments that respond to them in intelligent ways. And here I'm going to uh, just uh, quote uh, people like Arts, uh, Philip Bray, Weber, and others. And uh, this was made uh, possible by some developments in the field of artificial intelligence, among other technologies. So AMI also illustrates a kind of convergence as well as an emerging technology. And, and, and I 
development of a new field as well. Um, specifically, uh, AMI emerged from the convergence or interplay of uh, three relatively recent technologies, pervasive computing, ubiquitous communication, and intelligent user interfaces or IUIs. So just describe briefly. So these three key components that sort of underlie AMI, pervasive computing is defined as computing environment where information communication technologies everywhere, everyone at all times, it's just we're totally connected, it's, it's, uh, it's around us. Ubiquitous communication ensures that communication between links are, are continuous, flexible, omnipresent, so we're always connected. And then intelligent user interfaces, which go well beyond our traditional kinds of keyboard, mouse, monitor, uh, making the uh, interfaces more intuitive and efficient. So uh, IUIs, some now can, can know and sense far more about a person, uh, and, and depending on that person's uh, situation, context, environment. And oftentimes people are unaware of the existence of these IUIs in their environments uh, because they're invisible, they're minute, uh, they're tiny, they can be embedded in surroundings like walls, ceilings, uh, buildings, et cetera. And yet these network computers are aware of them. So another, just briefly, uh, the Internet of Things. Um, so developments in AMI technology have helped to make possible the Internet of Things, IoT for short. And that uh, enables humans to interact with objects or things in addition to typical kinds of websites and standard digital devices that are connected to the internet. So on the one hand, humans have been interacting with intelligent agents and with smart devices for several years now. On the other hand, the idea of smart devices and smart objects, smart things communicating with one another independent of human interaction or human oversight, as in the case of IoT, is still a relatively recent phenomenon. So AI, AMI and IoT technologies have helped enable smart homes, smart buildings, et cetera. They also enable users to search for things or objects through search engines like Shodan, which index things, webcams, smart TVs, refrigerators, et cetera, that are plugged in to the internet. So the kinds of search is now possible because of IoT go well beyond the typical kinds of searches that users have conducted in the past when looking for information on conventional search engines like Google, which index only the, uh, the web uh, via standard URLs, for example. So um, among the many ethical controversies affecting AMI and IoT, I'm just gonna briefly describe three of those, uh, freedom and autonomy, technological dependency, and privacy surveillance and the panopticon. So one important question we have is about our autonomy and our freedom with these kinds of technologies. Will autonomy and freedom be enhanced? Or will both be diminished as a result of these technologies? Proponents often point out the way we are going to have more control over our environments through these kinds of technologies. They'll be more responsive to our needs. Our life will be better. Whereas Diane says we'll have more human flourishing uh, than we had before. But as Philip Ray and others have noted, there's a paradox in this reasoning because the greater control is presumed to be gained through the delegation of control to machines. So are we gaining by delegating or who's going to control whom in this kind of thing? So it may uh, be that AMI and IoT could instead diminish the amount of control that humans have over their environments. I think the jury is still out on this. I think we need to be aware of it and respond to it with ethical policies. Regarding uh, dependency, uh, we've already come to depend so much on technology uh, that it's hard to imagine our day-to-day -day lives without it. I would, can imagine, for example, a, um, <clears throat> a millennial, being able to function without his or her smartphone. I just, I mean, I think we've become so dependent on these technologies. But in the future, will humans come to depend on AMI, IoT, and other smart technologies, including smart objects and smart environments in ways that exceed our current dependency? What would happen if, if as a result, we were losing our cognitive capacities because of an increased dependency on smart technologies? On the one hand, more technologies could relieve us of having to worry about performing many of our routine day-to-day -day tasks, which could be considered tedious and boring. On the other hand, uh, 
these technologies could also help eliminate much of the cognitive effort that's in the past able us to be fulfilled and flourish as human beings. I know my students seem shocked when I tell them that I still do most of my math manually. If I'm doing my income taxes, for example, I still do it longhand rather than use a calculator or, or a, a phone or a computer. And people look at me in amazement, but I thought I don't want to lose those basic eighth grade skills I somehow to, of just doing basic arithmetic. It's very easy to, to, to lose those kinds of skills. And I don't know how many of you may be familiar with E.M. Forrester's uh, When the Machine Stops, written in back in 1909. Like Julius Verne, he was kind of I guess, prescient in a way. Uh, he wasn't so much big on technologies as he's known for his literary work. But in The Machine Stops, he envisions a future where humans have uh, developed this wonderful global machine that makes, that makes life so pleasant and so wonderful that uh, we lose more and more touch with nature, with reality, et cetera. And over time, people forget how the machine was built, how to repair it, how to, to do updated or whatever. And one day the machine finally breaks down and no one can, can, can repair it. And what will humans do at this point? And I think we have to ask ourselves that question now, what will happen if we reach that, that uh, threshold uh, where we're so dependent that in the event we lose the technology, um, we're, uh, we're in, a, in dire straits. A third um, uh, ethical issue we'll look at uh, regarding AMY and IoT has to do with privacy. And we could say, well, we've had privacy issues ever since there were computers, right? Uh, we've had uh, concerns with databases. We've had concerns about a, a whole host of them. But um, Lagenreich has pointed out at least four features that differentiate some smart technologies from other kinds of cyber-specific privacy issues. For one thing, there is the ubiquity now. Privacy threats are more pervasive in scope uh, because of the ubiquitous or omnipresent computer devices that surround us. There's the threat of invisibility because computers are getting smaller and smaller, some even at the, at the, almost at the nano level, in which case they're difficult to see. So we might not even be realized if we're in a smart classroom or a smart building or a smart room that the data around us is being collected and uh, could be uh, disseminated down the road. Sensing devices now with many of the IUIs I mentioned are becoming so sophisticated that they seem to be able to sense private human emotions like fear, stress, excitement. And memory application, um, this kind of memory life log, like there used to be a program on TV called This Is Your Life that would recount all your events. Well now, once life is being recorded or can be recorded, there can be a history of one's life uh, from, the, or from the time they live in a certain environment, uh, an apartment, a house, et cetera. There could be uh, recordings made and captured and uh, that kind of uh, will follow us um, through our lives. So um, in these kind of AMI, IoT environments, no one can be sure that he or she is not being observed. So it would seem prudent for people to uh, interact in these environments to assume that they probably are being observed and recorded. So in this sense, people in these environments are subject to a virtual panopticon, a term uh, coined by 18th century philosopher, economist, social scientist, Jeremy Bentham. And if, um, if you're not familiar with Bentham's uh, inspection house or that, I'll, I'll just say a few words about it. Imagine um, you're in a prison and there is one prison guard who sits at a desk, a rotating desk. And the cells um, in which the prisoners are located are such that they have glass doors, glass walls. They can't see out, but the prison guard can see in. So the prison guard could see any person at some given point in time. And from the perspective of the prisoner, he doesn't know when the prison guard is observing he or she in that in that cell. So, um, would it be what would it be in the uh, best interest of the of the uh, prisoner to do? Well, to act as if he or she is being observed. So the question then becomes: Will this inspection house type of model, piano, Opticon, be extended to our contemporary public spaces such as the workplace and public buildings? 
Will that model also be sent to private intimate environments, such as our homes, apartments, and so forth? What effects could the possibility of being permanently observed have on our individual behavior, especially if it's used by many governments as a form of social control, like it's going on in China or Singapore, for example? Nine minutes, uh, Herman. Okay, thanks. So in Bentham's uh, Opticon, a prisoner could not be certain whether he or she was actually being monitored at a given point in time. Uh, but critics note that we can be certain almost 100% uh, now that we are, would be observed in these environments. So in classical forms uh, of surveillance uh, ranged over certain periods of time and place, but now as critics point out, it'll persist over space and time. And the information being captured about us is not, um, not just innocuous, it can be used to create personal uh, profiles and then used to make important decisions about us. So do we have an adequate framework to handle the kinds of challenges arising from IoT and other technologies? Is our standard applied ethics model sufficiently robust? Um, and typically when we look at uh, ethical issues, philosophers and ethicists tend to use a model similar like, like the following, the three steps. Identify a particular controversial technology as a moral problem, describe and analyze some clarifying concepts associated with the problem, and apply moral theories like utilitarianism, Kantianism, virtue ethics to, the, to reach a position about the moral issue. So if I take something like euthanasia, to identify the issue, describe and analyze the concepts, is it, are, are we talking about active euthanasia, passive euthanasia, voluntary, involuntary, and then depending on which one, which of those moral theories are we going to use? So will that framework work in an era of emerging technologies, like the ones we've examined so far. We can begin by asking who's impacted and um, who are the stakeholders in this situation? And basically it's not just the software engineers who design and implement the technologies, but also ordinary people, virtually everyone who's affected by the technologies in the near future. So <clears throat> we would all benefit from clear and uh, ethical policies uh, involving the development of these new technologies. So in the past, ethics was typically done after the fact. The technology is already available and then you do the ethics, you kind of play catch up, right? Some people call this the ethics last approach. And um, in that sense, ethics was kind of reactive. It followed rather than informed scientific developments. Uh, Jim Moore and John Weckert note that many scientific research areas, ethics has always had to play catch up because guidelines were developed in response to cases where serious harm had already been done. And because um, of this, many thought we should move to an ethics first type of strategy. And in the Human Genome Project, they were the first to really develop the kind of ethical, legal, and social issues they wanted to consider before the, before the work could, could, uh, could go forward. And Actually, what they did was have that, um, and they wanted to have these guidelines in place before they proceeded with, uh, with work on the, the Human Genome Project. But is that kind of approach, uh, like the LC model, going to help us with our uh, emerging technologies? Will help us to better understand those technologies? Specifically, would it have worked best in addressing the kinds of controversial issues that arose uh, in new technologies like IMI and IoT? Um, many people like that kind of model because it's proactive rather than the kind of reactive ethics framework. But some philosophers, including Moore, Weckert, and others, are critical of the first ethics first uh, approach in general. Um, it's a couple of different problems. Ethics depends on knowing the factual determination of specific harms and benefits before uh, you can, the assessment can be done. But we don't know beforehand what many of those are it's difficult to know what the future will be. So we can ask whether an LC-like uh, model would be in our best interest. Um, critics like, again, like more records say it, it might put a moratorium on research without helping us all advance the ethics. So the moratorium would be, it might uh, help in some sense with the ethics, but it's not, it's not going to advance the technology and it's not really gonna be able to, um, to help us develop the ethics in a meaningful way. So should we go back to an ethics last kind of model? Turning back is not the, uh, gonna be the answer either because we do that much of the harm already be in place before we address the ethical issues. 
So neither the ethics first or ethics last model uh, seems to be adequate in handling many emerging technologies. Since ethics is not static, but dynamic, I agree with Moore and Weckert that it has to be done continually as a specific technology continues to develop. And as we find out more and more about the potential consequences as they become better understood. So an adequate ethic model needs to be uh, dynamic because the factual component, the descriptive aspects need to be understood and continually updated as we go forward. So um, we noted earlier that there are three different components in the traditional model. Identify, describe, and apply the moral theories. We can now add a fourth step to that model. Update the ethical analysis by continuing to differentiate between the factual, descriptive, and normative components of the new emerging technology under consideration, and to revise those policies affecting the technology as necessary, especially as the factual data changes or as information about potential social impacts become clearer. And um, so I've argued that we benefit by expanding the state of ethics model in the context of new and emerging technologies, but not argued for a brand new ethical framework. While some believe we should have a new ethical framework, I think we can just instead expand the model. There are also some other ways in which that model could be expanded and grouped upon, which is a topic for a different talk. I think we need to, to address um, the issues at the design stage by looking at some of the value sense of design like uh, Matthew Friedman's talked about and Philip Gray, and also expand the model to include uh, questions about moral considerations for AI entities. Again, it's a talk for a different time. I wanna address those points today. Um, so basically, this is just a list of references and works cited. And um, I'd like to, uh, to thank Professor Katina Michael for inviting me today and uh, my colleague uh, at Riviera for going over a draft this with me. And finally, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attention. And if time permits, I look forward to your questions. I regret having to, um, to rush through the slides, but I feared at the end I would not make it. So uh, please, Accept my apologies for the hasty uh, presentation for the end. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Devani. Um, we will have you back. Uh, it was a problem of my uh, scheduling that has left us with no time for questions. I actually lecture in two minutes, uh, but Professor, we will have you back. Um, okay. We will have you back. Uh, the importance of the conclusion that you've come to uh, has a lot of implications uh, especially for standards like the IEEE P7000 series, ethical, ethical alignment by design, uh, mm -hmm. the operationalization of socio-technical theory, for example, uh, incorporating the ethical uh, dimension uh, in its, its investigations. Uh, I know Dr. Abba Abbas of Australia often talks about your work in that context uh, and cites it very often. Um, and so this dynamism that you are encouraging us to adopt is exactly the way to go. Uh, I too agree with you. Ethics is not uh, static. Um, it's not cross-sectional. It's longitudinal. And uh, just because we've instituted something with a given emerging technology, it doesn't mean we don't revisit that. The same with technology assessments, various risk assessments, and uh, uh, various um, matters. Um, we've got beautiful uh, comments from the audience. Gershon's coming to us from Ghana, uh, Professor. And uh, he says, wonderful presentation in the chat. Um, but truly, uh, to do justice to what you've given us uh, would take three hours. Uh, just like our previous speaker, uh, Diane Martin, I thank both of you uh, so much again. This has been a highlight of my career, and I endeavor to have you back in the future. Um, Katie Kaminsky says, uh, thank you all so much. What an honor to spend uh, the afternoon with you both, uh, professors. Um, we're all indebted for your life's work, your life's contribution. Please continue to talk to us and to teach us and uh, to provide uh, wisdom direction. Uh, Naz says, thanks for organizing. Thank you. And thank you for everyone for coming. I can't underscore Professor Martin and Professor Tavani what it means to people uh, of our generation to hear you uh, because we grew up with your books. And I want to continue that tradition to the younger generation coming through they have to know about your work. We can't just be citing the last 12 months or the last three years as academics. This goes back 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, back to Mumford, beyond Mumford, back to the philosophers. Uh, and uh, we are so lucky, 
so lucky to have you with us and to, to have you uh, give to us and please continue to give uh, as much as possible. We need you. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Uh, and Professor Martin, uh, we'll end the presentation here and wishing you all a wonderful week. Bye now. Thank you.